Yes, as you might have seen, I uh, had to change the title a little bit, making it more specific to one kind of work that I will talk about. I will also talk a little bit about what I mean by lifelong learning um, and what we can do to get closer to it. Um, but I thought this title describes better what is actually going on. So um, feel free if this is too specific to, well, leave. Um, but I hope I'll make it interesting for everybody. Um, <coughs> okay, so welcome to the talk. My name is Christoph Lampert. Um, I come to you from IST Austria. Um, and many of you will not have heard what IST Austria is. Um, that is okay, because IST is a very new thing that hasn't really spread all over um, the scientific community yet. So let me give you one example, um, one slide summary of what IST Austria is. Um, we are a research institute for basic research um, located close to Vienna. It's an English-speaking institute that was started just a few years ago in order to put Vienna and Austria back on the map of international research. If you look 100 years ago, there was a lot of science going on in Vienna, lots of famous scientists. If you look at it now, maybe there's one or two that you might have heard of, but Austria is not a major scientific location uh, anymore. Um, so this is the effort to put Austria back on the map um, with an institute that is dedicated to world-class, high-quality international research. Um, international is important. It's a very mixed institute, lots of different countries. It's fully English. <coughs> um, we have um, a focus on interdisciplinary research. Um, there's currently 41 research groups in computer science, mathematics, physics, biology, neuroscience. Um, there's no department, so it's small groups and they collaborate with each other. It's an uh, interesting format. Um, if, in case you want to move to Austria at some time during your career, send me an email. We have um, openings in basically all levels from intern and PhD student to faculty. Um, okay, that's enough of the advertising. Um, let's come to the science. Um, I run a research group for computer vision and machine learning at IST Austria. It's a small group. Um, in this case, the group uh, consists of at least four Russian speakers, um, which is one of the reasons that I'm here. Um, so I have a lot of Russian expertise in my group already. Um, we are funded mainly by the institute itself. It's a, it's a base funding scheme. Um, and an ERC grant that lets me uh, do research on lifelong learning, which is part of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, um, research topics that we work on, for those of you who already um, know a lot about machine learning, maybe these will, will tell you something. Um, if you have questions later, I mean, I'd be happy um, to, to talk about any of these in detail. I'll be around until Friday afternoon. Um, and I'll be here on campus tomorrow for the lecture and on Friday for the lecture. Lifelong learning and um, learning in general with dependent data instead of independent data. We also work on modeling and algorithms, things like uh, zero-shot learning, weekly supervised learning. And it's a machine learning group that's not focused on applications, but it also does some applications. And typically, these are in computer vision then, which gives nice visual illustrations of what's going on. Um, today here, I will just talk about a few things. I will talk about multitask learning, lifelong learning, and how domain adaptation is useful uh, for that. Yes. Excuse me, before we proceed, yes. uh, what is uh, zero-shot learning? Ah. I know learning, but what is zero-shot learning? Zero-shot learning is like, so one-shot learning is learning a classifier from one example. Zero-shot learning is learning a classifier from zero examples. But how can it be? Exactly. Um, actually, I, okay, so in that case, zero-shot learning would be you, you build a classifier, but not based on training examples, but based on other properties. So one example we did was you, you build a classifier based on properties. If you want a classifier that recognizes zebras and images, you can say, find an object that is black, white, and has stripes. Um, if your computer knows what black is, what white is, and what stripes are, which you have to teach it before, then it will be able to recognize zebras pretty reliably without ever having seen one. So it's like programming a classifier in a way that is not training examples. It's, it's a cute topic. Um, I will not talk about it right now. Um, I will talk more about the theoretical part today. Um, but the other topics are also covered this week. So I will talk about probabilistic graphical models uh, in the lecture that was yesterday, tomorrow, and on Friday. Um, if you're interested in weekly supervised learning, more computer vision topics, image segmentation, object localization, you can come to the lecture at Skoltech uh, the day after tomorrow. Um, 
Learn with dependent data classifier adaptation uh, will be on Thursday as well. And I'll even talk a few minutes about zero shot learning using semantic image representation, which we call attributes. Um, that's a short segment when I'll be at Moscow State uh, on Friday. So if you're interested in any of these topics, um, drop by at these talks or let me let me know and I can tell you more afterwards. Okay, but today it's going to be about multitask learning and domain adaptation techniques for life learning. Um, I'm going to start with a gentle introduction. I, I was told that um, not everybody here has a machine learning background. When I came in and I saw all of the keyboards at the, at the entrance, I was very impressed. Um, so I think you all know much more about machine learning than the people typically at my institute. Um, but I'm still going to start with a more gentle introduction for those who are not experts. And for the others, you can think of it as an as a introduction of my notation to machine learning. So that I mean, they're compatible in terms of symbols. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you learn multiple tasks at the same time, how you can benefit from that. And then I will go into our own work on <laughs> multitask learning. If some of the tasks have only unlabeled data. So it's a supervised learning tasks, but you only have unlabeled. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can go on for it. Um, <laughs> But you have only unlabeled data for some of the tasks. Can you still do something? Um, the answer is yes. OK, so starting with machine learning, um, I'm mean, always impressed how broad of a field machine learning is. So in theory, it should be the science of designing and analyzing automatic systems that draw conclusions from empirical data. That's one of the many definitions you find. Um, but then different people have very different ideas. So one thing that is, at the moment, extremely popular and what you see all over the news um, in the media is all the applications that machine learning has these days. Um, if you think of robotics or time series predictions, social networks, language uh, technology, healthcare, natural sciences, all of this are areas where applications of machine learning have become extremely successful. Um, so, for example, this down here, it's Rick Rashid of Microsoft at a conference in China, and he gives a speech which is automatically translated by a computer into Chinese, not just the words, but with his own language and intonation, as if he were speaking Chinese. It still makes mistakes, but it's possible for him to give a talk just in English, and they understand as if he were speaking bad Chinese. Uh, and there's the, as, I mean, people say that people have been crying in the audience because now the language barrier has been broken down, and so on and so on. Um, personalized medicine is a big thing. Maybe by analyzing your genetic code using learning techniques, we can build drugs that are specific for a person instead of just have to, hoping that one drug will work for everybody, and so on, and so on. So machine learning has tons of applications, and it's only going to be more over the next year. Uh, so this is what, what drives people. Um, maybe um, if you work on machine learning, you're interested more in the systems aspect of it, like building large databases, clusters, um, big data applications, which um, here is an example of how you train these new deep learning methods which need a lot of computing power and there's a lot of open research questions how we do that in data centers and efficiency and so on. Um, this is also an aspect of, of machine learning. Um, what I find most interested about machine learning is the fundamentals that maybe go back to, to Turing, um, where the question is how can a machine or any kind of system learn from data at all? What are the driving principles? What does it mean to learn and in order to make decisions or predictions <coughs> later. Um, so that is more on the theoretical side, less on the building computer sy system side, so, and this is what I'm going to concentrate on today, one specific uh, topic in that area. <coughs> okay, so let me start with some introduction to the, to the concepts I will need. Um, if you had a machine learning course, then most likely these are familiar to you. Um, I will talk about learning, and of course, before I can talk formally about learning, I have to say what does learning mean. So I will talk about learning tasks, and a learning task is just a, a, a collection of things you need. Um, if you want to learn a function, what you need is an input domain for your function, I will call that curly x, um, and an output set of possible values you want to predict, I will call that curly y. Um, one example is a spam filter, your input is emails, your output is the label spam or not spam. Um, if you want to do a self-driving car, your input might be a camera, your output might be drive forward, turn left, and so on. Um, <clears throat> in order to decide if you learned a good thing or not, you need some kind of measure of evaluation. 
So that will be a loss function. I will call it, write it as a curly L. And it, the interpretation is, if I have a loss of two things, one of them is the correct answer, the other is the answer I actually made, and this will tell me what's the cost for me if I make a prediction Y bar, if the correct prediction would have been Y. Um, and finally, in order to define the problem itself, we need to connect how inputs and outputs are supposed to belong to each other, and that's based by a, a probability distribution over X and Y jointly that tells you how, what's the probability of an X and a Y co-occurring. So I will just pretend that X and Y are discrete, so I can write summations if I have to and so on. Of course, this is all, I mean, if you do this formally, then you need to care about measurability and so on, but I will just um, ignore these parts. Um, what is a learning task now? A learning task is we know what we want to achieve, so we know what the input is, we know what the output is. We also know what is a good and what is a bad answer, or at least how to measure if two answers were good or bad. Um, but we do not know the data distribution. Nobody tells us what the correct distribution of data in the world is. Um, it's not going to be a Gaussian or so. What do I know about the email uh, distribution? Yeah. Uh, sorry, so if uh, D is distribution, then you can have several, you can have different correct answers yes. for the same input, um, depending the, on the, how the dice roll. Um, you, you don't have multiple correct answers, but you have, there's a probability that it's either one or the other, yes. So in any specific instance, there's, there might be uncertainty. You can model the prediction of the lottery or of rolling a die um, using this where, yes, there's still uncertainty for every fixed input. There's an uncertainty what the correct output would be. Yes. That's sometimes unavoidable. Some problems, we cannot be perfect in our prediction. There's always a small um, possibility of error. In fact, in the second half, I will go to the setting where it's deterministic. But the, the general principle is it also works if you have uncertainty in your labels. OK, so what is the goal of learning? The goal of learning is to find a function that makes predictions. So it should be a function, let's call it h, from x to y. Um, and we want it to be good, good predictions. What does that mean? It should make predictions that have a small loss. So for every possible input x, we want the probability um, that when I apply my function h to the input x and I compare it to a true output y, well, that incurs a loss, and I want that in expectation this loss is small. And we call this the generalization error. Um, and, well, it's a central quantity in learning which generally we want to have small. We want to, in expectation, make few mistakes. <coughs> Of course, this generalization error is not accessible to us, right? We, have, we don't know what the data distribution is, so we cannot compute expectations over it. Um, but we might be given a training set. Um, so I will assume that we are given some data S, and this S is tuples of inputs and outputs. So we interpret this as here's some examples of what an input with a correct output is. Um, and technically, we assume that these are independently sampled from the true distribution. So they are IID samples from the data distribution. And with that, we can define an, another quantity that is the so-called empirical risk. Uh, it's the empirical version of the risk on the previous slide. So for all the training examples we see, we compute the loss of taking the input of the training as uh, argument for our prediction, comparing it to the output that incurs a loss, and then averaging that over all the training data, we get the so-called empirical error, the other central quantity. Um, I also call it training error because it's the error that happens when we evaluate a classifier on the training data that we've seen. <coughs> okay, so now we have all the important ingredients. Uh, we can try to connect them. Um, and we can connect them by the principle of empirical risk minimization. That means, um, given a set of possible functions, maybe they are all linear functions or all polynomials or all neural network functions, the goal is to find the classifier that has the smallest risk, the smallest error in expectation. We can't do that, but what we can do is we can find the classifier of smallest training error. So find a classifier in all the space of all possible ones that minimizes the average loss over the training set. This is called empirical risk minimization, and it's the core of, of many of the learning algorithms we have. Um, is it a good idea or not? That depends. So there's a fundamental theorem um, by uh, Chabalinkis and, and Vapnik which says that this strategy is a good strategy only under some conditions. And the technical condition they found is that the set of, that we search over, so the set of all possible hypotheses, um, 
has to have a small uh, finite VC dimension. I'm not going to define VC by dimension, but you can think of it as something like degrees of freedom. So if you have infinitely many degrees of freedom, then um, this will not necessarily give you a good... Yes? Uh, what is VC dimension? Um, technically, it's, it, it's a measure of how, how many degrees of freedom your classifiers can have. If it's a linear classifier, the VC dimension is just the number of dimensions. But if it's a nonlinear function, then it's, it's, a, it's a bigger number. Um, I'm not going to give you the technical term. Think of it something like degrees of freedom. So if your classifiers have infinitely many degrees of freedom, that means they can basically memorize all the training data you can put into them. Then this strategy is not a good strategy. The, the actual definition is a bit more involved. I mean, you can find it in a textbook. Um, but I, I will not go into detail here. Um, the main insight was that this VC dimension is actually a central quantity. If it's finite, then this is a good strategy. If it's infinite, it's not a good strategy. So there's a, a, a clear dichotomy between the two. Um, so in the following, we'll assume that it's finite because otherwise this principle makes uh, little sense anyway. <coughs> okay, why, how do you know that this is a good idea? you use a generalization bound. And I'm going to use some other generalization bounds later. So here's a very simple one that uh, Javanenkis and Bapnik proved in the 70s. Um, remember, this is the quantity we care about. It's the actual loss and expectation in the future, the risk. This is what we can compute on the training data. So this bound tells you that these two are similar to each other. Their difference is small. So what you really want and what you can compute are close to each other. Um, and how close they are, it depends on this magic DC dimension, and it mat matters on some delta parameter that tells you how confident you want to be, but mainly it also depends on the number of training examples n. So the more training examples you see, the difference between the two will shrink like one over square root of n. That's a good knowledge to have. Um, and the important part is that this holds simultaneously for all classifiers that you could possibly choose. Um, so that's a that's a central quantity that uh, you, you, you might want to uh, control. Um, how is that useful to us? Well, if the difference between is small, that means we can bring one of them to the other side, like that one. So what we get is the quantity we actually care about will be upper bounded by the empirical error on the training set plus some constant that shrinks with the number of examples. So if you look at this for a while, you will see that um, the right-hand side has only quantities that we can compute. The left-hand side is what we care about, we cannot compute it. The right-hand side is what we actually uh, can compute. And we know that the right-hand side bounds the left-hand side. So if we can find a hypothesis H such that the right-hand side is really, really small, that means the left-hand side also must have been small. So we found something that will work not just on the training set, but also on the future. <coughs> so. Choosing the hypothesis that minimizes the right-hand side of one of these bounds is typically a good idea. It's, it, it's a provable strategy for giving you a classifier that will work well in the future. <coughs> okay? So that's my summary of the, of the learning theory part. Um, for some algorithms, like the empirical risk minimization here, it is possible to give actual guarantees of how well they work on future data. That's very different from, from a more engineering approach where you just write down your algorithm and try it out on different data sets and see if it works or not. But for some algorithms, you can actually give guarantees. Um, and there's a way of constructing such algorithms. You have to prove a bound first that bounds the quantity you can actually want, I mean, they actually care about, the generalization error. How can you bound this in terms of quantities that you can compute from data? So if you can achieve that, then your algorithm just consists of minimizing the right-hand side of the bound, and then you have found a guarantee that the left-hand side is also small, at least as small as the other one. Um, it's not always practical to actually minimize these bounds. They might be nasty, they might not be convex, they might not be differentiable, and so on. But it's also a good way of just getting inspiration how to derive new algorithms that have guarantees on their performance. I mean, or at least that they are inspired by this. So you, you minimize the right quantities. Yes? So this is only true if the, your data set is IAD. Yes. <coughs> so, well, I have a hard time checking that. Sure. 
Um, as I said, it's, a, it's also an inspiration, right? Um, well, I mean, you can prove very, very similar things if your data is non-IID, it's dependent, but from the correct distribution. Um, it's harder if your distribution changes, yes. In effect, what I'm going to talk about next is what happens if the distribution changes. Okay, so this is one of the, the things I like about theory, um, that um, if you do it right, you actually not just, you're not just proving a theorem, that's great, but you also get a recipe how to uh, get an actual algorithm out of it, um, which you can then hopefully apply to real data and solve real problems without losing the guarantees that you started with. Okay, so that was classic textbook material from the 70s. Now, what we care about is learning not just one task, which is well explored and I mean, we, we know the theory. Um, what happens if you want to learn multiple things? This is a very realistic, very common thing. I mean, you rarely have a system that only needs to care about horses or zebras, or you don't want a, a, a car that no, only knows how to turn left, but it doesn't learn how to turn right, right. So it's very often the situation that you want to learn multiple tasks at the same time using training data. Um, so if I use this visualization of the learning process, you get some data, you have some kind of learning algorithm, and then you are able to make some predictions afterwards, hopefully good ones. Then what typically happens in multitask learning is you just do all of them together. So here's one learning task, here's another learning task, here's another learning task. And what most of the state-of-the-art algorithms do these days is they just solve it exactly that way. So if you want to, I don't know, classify images, if they contain cats or not, if they contain dogs, and if they contain horses, the three learning tasks, um, what would the computer do? You would collect training data for cats, you would learn a cat classifier, you would be able to make predictions for cats. Then you would collect training data for dogs, you would do a dog classifier, you would be able to predictions for dogs, and so on. And there's actually, the moment you start with dogs, you forget everything you have learned about cats before. Clearly that is not a very smart strategy, and no reasonable learning algorithm, a natural system would learn that way. Imagine you go to, I mean, university, and before you start learning about algebra, you forget everything you learned about natural numbers. I mean, why? Right? I mean, you would like to build on top of the knowledge that you already have, and that should make it easier to learn new things. At the moment, com machine learning is not there. It's almost exclusively throw away everything you learned before, start from scratch. And that, I mean, is to me a very, very inefficient, stupid use of, of data and uh, GPUs and so on. So I call this approach tabular learning. You erase, your, you start with a clean slate whenever you start something new. Um, what we are looking for in my group and in part of a, a European project um, is on the one hand multitask learning where you do not learn these tasks isolated but you actually learn all of them together. You have one algorithm that takes the input of all the tasks and afterwards is able to make predictions for all the tasks. So that's multitask learning. And what is our final goal would be a lifelong learning algorithm. So that is an algorithm that is able to learn multiple tasks, one after the other possibly, but it does not forget everything in between. So yes, you have to learn about cats. For that, you need data about cats. You will learn, your algorithm will be able to make predictions afterwards, but it keeps some information around that will be useful for it in the future. So it preserves some kind of memory such that when it in the future learns about another task, about dogs, it still has the memory of the old um, task in some representation and uses that in order to get better. And that should accumulate over time such that ultimately you can learn much more difficult concepts than when you started with. For natural systems, that is completely normal. Every, every animal does that. Um, humans, hopefully, as well. For computers, it's not the case yet. <coughs> okay, so let me talk about um, one of the um, projects we recently had in my group, it's by my student Asya, uh, actually here from Moscow. Um, she's always complaining that Vienna is too small. She really loves Moscow. Uh, Vienna has just two million, it's tiny. So. Um, and it's called Active Task Pledge for Multitask Learning. Um, and I want to tell you what that is in a second. So <coughs> we're going to work on multitask learning, meaning we do have data for multiple tasks given at the same time. And we want one algorithm to solve all of these problems such that we're able to make predictions for all of these tasks. Um, 
There's many examples of that that make sense. So think of a, a speech recognition system in your iPhone, Siri or so. Um, since every user talks a little bit differently, it makes sense to have an individualized system for every person. Um, but, I mean, of course, people are so similar to we, so we can reuse information and hopefully in an efficient way. Um, spam classification is another thing. I personally don't react well if I get an email about Viagra, but other people actually want to read emails about Viagra. So spam filters also have to be personalized. Um, that's many, I mean, every user is a learning task of, an, of him own. <clears throat> so the setting we're going to look at is learning um, multiple paths at the same time, and of course there is a lot of state-of-the-art research about that already. Um, people came up with some ideas, how can you, when you learn multiple things together, how can these tasks benefit from each other? Um, one idea is, let's share, if, you, if your classifier is a parameter thing, like a neural network or a linear classifier, maybe you can share parameters between each other. Um, and typically the main assumption is all the tasks are minor variations of each other. And then um, you, can, you can say, let's, let's introduce some kind of core tasks such that all the individual tasks are just minor variations of that. Um, and that typically has the form of some regularizer, if you, if you know about regularization. Um, these are the most successful techniques. Um, you can also think of it as not tasks are all similar, but all the tasks have something in common in terms of data representation. So um, you would learn um, not individual data representation for each task, but you would share the data representation up to a certain level, and only afterwards the tasks would be separated from each other. And that's typically what goes on in deep learning neural networks, where you can, you can learn many things, but some of the layers are shared, and only afterwards layers are not separ uh, separate off from each other. Um, finally, you can think about sharing the actual examples. So you can share samples where um, you might take samples that actually are of a different task, but now you take them in order to help you. So maybe if you classify horses, you can take a few zebras into the data set um, because they look similar, and if you ignore the stripes, basically a zebra is just a fancy horse. So you can reuse additional data, and as we saw before, the more data for a task you have, the better your estimation will get. So borrowing samples from other tasks is typically a good idea if they have the right distribution. <coughs> All of these are successful and they do things. Um, what they have in common is that they all only work if you really have labeled examples from all the tasks. So you need to have one training set per task with annotation and so on. Um, so what we wanted to look at is a new setting where for some of the tasks you do not have labeled training data. So um, you're given a set of tasks. Let's say you want to learn speech recognition for 10 different users, uh, T different users, it could be a million users. Um, but there will only be unlabeled data for all of them. Um, and then the algorithm can pick a few of these tasks, say, I want labels for this task, this task, and this task. For those, it gets labels. And then afterwards, you want it to output classifiers for all possible tasks. Um, so the speech recognition example is actually one I like because I think it's very realistic that you do not want um, to bother every user with annotating his own speech patterns. So typically, it's very easy to collect unlabeled data. I mean, the people talk into their phone all day, right? So in principle, you can collect their speech. That's no problem. But having annotation, which word they said corresponds to which word, I mean, in writing, or which vowel was which sound, that is what annoys people. So you don't want an hour of tr I mean, telling Siri which letter you pronounce in what way. Um, so if you can reduce the number of people who actually do have to do that, your acceptance of the product will go up immensely. So <clears throat> the right strategy, at least, I would think, is you, you pick a small number of representative speakers, you bother them, say, please give me annotation data. They will not be happy, but maybe you pay them for it. Um, then you get information from them, which means labels, annotation from them, and then you use this in order to build speech recognition systems for everybody, even the ones who did not provide, provide you with data. Um, is this going to work in general? I mean, that clearly depends. If all the speakers are different, if they speak, everybody speaks a different language, clearly asking just one of them to provide information about somebody who speaks a completely different language is not a strategy that will be very successful. If they all happen to be the same, they just registered with different accounts, 
it's a perfect strategy. One person is enough to annotate all of them because they're all the same person. Right? So it means under some assumptions on how tasks are related, this should be a successful strategy. Under other assumptions, it will not. And the question is, can we quantify this? Can we give pro guarantees? And can we derive principled algorithms for this setting um, based on the I mean, observations that we made? <coughs> OK, so let's try. Um, if you remember, I introduced the learning task as learning a function from x to y that has a loss function and a joint probability. For simplicity, I will I mean, simplify this now. I will only talk about binary classification tasks where you only have two outputs, 0 or 1, or maybe y is 1 or 1, so not arbitrary prediction tasks. Um, I will only look at 0, 1 loss, meaning your loss function says check if it was correct or incorrect. If it was incorrect, the loss is 1. If it was correct, the loss is 0, the easiest case. Um, and I will only talk about the realizable situation, which means there is one correct answer to every input. So there is actually a labeling function, a deterministic function, that gives you the correct labels, but you don't know it. Um, and then the, the actual inputs are still distributed according to some unknown data distribution, which we now call d of x. Is the distribution shared between all tasks? Um, no. Every task has their own distribution. Um, and also the labeling function is very different. I mean, this is just one task, right? So in fact, um, where is it? Yes, so we, in the end, we're going to have multiple tasks. Each of them has their own distribution and their own labeling function. Um, OK. So what do we want to do? Well, we get, for a few tasks, we get um, labeled data. And then we can compute the empirical risk. That's just the sum over the losses of the training data again. And we can use any algorithm we want in order to learn a classifier. It can be empirical risk minimization. We can also do support vector machines if we like. We can do deep learning and so on. So the tasks for which we have labels are really not the problem. We know how to solve these. Um, but for some of the tasks, we do not have any kind of annotation. We only have data, so data sets, sample sets, which are only inputs without any outputs. And we still want to learn a classifier for those. How can we do that? Well, one idea is to say, what, um, if we cannot train a new classifier, we just reuse one of the other ones. Right? So we already learned a few classifiers for the tasks which do have annotation. Now let's use the one that is best for our purpose. Um, and we don't know which one is best because we cannot check how well it does, but we can check what is the most similar task of the labeled ones and then reuse the information from the most similar task. And it just boils down to the question of what does similar mean in this respect. <coughs> so what's the measure of similarity? You're given two tasks, D1 with a labeling function F1 and D2 with a labeling function D2. How can we determine how similar they are to each other? Um, well, they are distributions. They're actually joint distributions over x inputs and outputs if we put the two together, the, the distribution d and the labeling function f. So we can try to compare the distributions. The easiest measure, or at least the most canonical measure of between distributions would be the kohlberg leiber divergence. Um, so we would just say, this is a measure of similarity between two tasks. It's the expectation over the ratio of the logarithm, if we assume it's a density. Um, Will this tell us much about which tasks we should use out of the labeled ones in order to solve unlabeled ones? Unfortunately, most likely not. Um, in particular, if one of these distributions is not absolutely continuous with respect to the other, um, the KL divergence will be infinity, and that's not a really good measure. Um, in particular, it will happen immediately as soon as the labeling functions disagree, uh, because they live on a small submanifold. That's not a situation where you want to apply kohlberg leiber divergence. So that's not a good, good attempt. The next thing is you could say, well, um, maybe we can look only at the distribution of the input data and forget about the labeling functions for a moment, and then we have some, hopefully some kind of nice and smooth distributions and the KL will work better. Um, you can do that. It will turn out it's a very strict criterion still, um, and we will not be able to make a good job estimating this quantity from the data that we've seen. Ultimately, we do not have access to the Ds, right? We only have access to the sample sets and that's not easy to estimate what the kohlberg leiber divergence between distributions would be based on just a few observed samples. So unless you have some parametric assumption like your data is Gaussian. But we don't make any assumptions about what the data distribution looks like. We only want to measure scale. It's 
not very, very realistic. Luckily, there was a better suggestion, um, not from us, um, and that's called the discrepancy distance. It's a, I like it very much, it's a very nice concept. Um, so imagine you're given a set of hypotheses, for example, all linear classifiers or all neural networks or something like that. Um, then you define the error of a pair of hypotheses as the expectation of how often they disagree. So under this distribution, how often do these two classifiers disagree? That's like a, a distribution-dependent similarity between classifiers now. Um, and then the discrepancy distance between two distributions, D1 and D2, is you check how often or where do these two, classi do two classifiers disagree on one distribution, where do they disagree on the other distribution, and then you take the worst, the maximum over this difference across all possible pairs of classifiers. Um, and that will tell you essentially um, what's the maximal disagreement that you can achieve using hypotheses from your hypothesis class. So what's the maximal difference you can achieve in any way by making one of the classifiers the ground truth and the other classifier the one you actually predict. Um, the nice thing is it's adjusted to the hypothesis class. Um, so if you have a small hypothesis class with a very simple function, just linear ones, then this quantity will also go smaller, um, so you have less work to do. And if, it's, um, if your hypothesis class is gigantic, then it will be a large number. But I mean, usually then learning is hard anyway. Um, this is not the most intuitive way of uh, defining a distance, but actually there's a nice way of thinking about it. And that is, um, it's related to how you estimate these things. So the discrepancy distance you can actually estimate from data. So if you have two sample sets, as one and as two, then a good estimate of your discrepancy between um, the two distributions, you can define the empirical version of it, uh, which will be twice, once minus e, where e is the error of take, trying to learn a classifier that distinguishes one of the sample sets from the other. So if you can find a classifier that clearly separates one from the other, then your discrepancy will be large. And if you cannot find a classifier that does that, your discrepancy will be small. And the nice thing is you can show that if your sample sets go to infinity, this converges in a very controlled way using bounds to the quantity of interest. Yes? I wonder where the cross-validation lives here. So, uh, for instance, we can <coughs> overfit two models and both number of uh, errors will be just zero. So how do we estimate those number of, uh, of errors right in the, the third, uh, third line? This one or that one? Uh, so the, ex the expected number of uh, discrepancies. Do we estimate it? So just uh, in the beginning of your definition. There. Uh, this, one. this is the mathematical quantity. There's no, I mean, you fix a classifier, you fix two classifiers, this is the, just the mathematical expectation over the true distribution. You cannot compute that. And so do we estimate it with uh, cross validation? We don't estimate that one at all. What we estimate is, we want to estimate this quantity with mathematically is defined this way. And, and how we estimate it is, we train a classifier, we check its empirical error, so we look at the training error on, on, these, on this task. So there's no generalization going on here. It's just a question of how well can we separate the two sets from each other. Um, so there's no, there no need to like, find the best classifier that generalizes the future data for this task. Here it's just, can you separate the training data at all? So let me give you just an example. Um, here's two, two learning tasks. This is the, the data of one task without labels. Somewhere, some of these will be one class, some of them will be the other class. We don't know which ones, they are unlabeled. This is the same for the second task. We also don't know what the labels are, but we know where the data points are. Now, if you have some kind of hypothesis class, for example, linear classifiers, it's pretty easy to find a classifier that separates these two sample sets from each other. And that means the discrepancy between these two tasks will be large. <coughs> In this situation, where you give them two sample sets, um, Visually, they overlap much more, and you will not be able to find a classifier that really well separates the two sets. Just, just counting errors on this set, no generalization to future data. Um, so here you will not find any linear classifier that separates them well, um, and that means that it will have a small discrepancy. And if your number of samples goes to infinity, it will converge to the number of, uh, I mean, to the true number. Um, here it will be a small one. Um, that also shows how important the hypothesis class is. So if you have a situation like this, um, it's a bit artificial, but it could happen. 
There will not be a, lot, uh, a linear classifier that separates these really, really well. Every linear separation will somewhat make mistakes. Um, so with respect to linear classifiers, it will be a small discrepancy. That means to a linear classifier, these distributions are not, I mean, they are almost similar. But with respect to a nonlinear hypothesis, it's very easy to, to separate them. So with respect to a nonlinear hypothesis class, the discrepancy will be large. So the discrepancy is really a measure that is adjusted to how powerful your classifier is. Yes. Um, I was not intending to interrupt you. I mean, you That's fine. Raised, uh, so if you're going back to the example of human speech, mm -hmm. then actually the right classifier can't tell between different people. The right classifier cannot tell between different people. Yes, true. So if the sounds you make are the same as the sound of another person, then you are a good, I mean, you have a low discrepancy. If the sounds you make are very dissimilar to another person, then all hell right, my long, my break it. Ah, okay. So that, that's how people okay. should, uh, should not make um, but, yes, but what enters here is really the hypothesis class. So you represent your speech in some feature space. You extract, I don't know, frequency, pattern, bands, or something from it. Um, in that representation, you can either tell them apart or not. Your human ear is really, really good at telling people apart. That is true. But the computer might not be. That depends on how you present your data. If you just represent sound as the average intensity, everybody sounds the same. If you do it in a very, very fine detailed level, it will be very different. Okay? So do we really need this idea of discrepancy? Can we replace the hypothesis class with distribution classes? Take some density models to observations of, of each task and uh, then resort to using compact with the or something like that? Um, I would, there's two answers. So this, I mean, there's different ways of doing it. This is the one we actually made work. But um, typically, we try to avoid making some kind of distributional assumption. So I have really, really no good idea how the sounds that I make at the moment, what distribution they have in a 12,000 dimensional feature space of some audio features. Yes, it's not going to be Gaussian, right? It's, and we have no clue what it is. But aren't you explicitly uh, making similar assumptions when you choose the hypothesis? Um, the hypothesis class is chosen by my own convenience because this is the hypothesis class of the classifiers we want to learn. If I want to train a neural network, I will measure this with respect to neural networks. If I want to use linear classifiers, I use the discrepancy coming from linear classifiers. So this, um, whatever you want to use in order to build a classifier in the end is the one you have to use for this measure. Okay. So this discrepancy measure is actually quite nice. Let me show you why. Um, <coughs> It was originally arrived in the domain adaptation literature. Domain adaptation is the question of if you train a classifier on some data distribution, but then you apply it to a different data distribution. So you train it on male faces, but then you apply it to female faces. Um, what can you still say? It's not independently, I mean, it's not sampled from the right distribution. A priori, you shouldn't be able to say anything. If I train it on Chinese, it will not work on English. That's not surprising. Um, but you can actually still say a few things, and some of the things you can say are based on discrepancy. So imagine you have two tasks, one on which you train your classifier, and one on which you later want to uh, use it. Um, then you know that the error you will make on the one where you use it will not be bigger than the error you made on the original domain, plus the discrepancy between the two domains, plus one extra term, and this extra term basically checks if there's any hypothesis that works on both. So is there even any classifier that works both? Um, if there isn't one that works on both problems, then, well, there's no hope to actually solve this. Um, so that is a, it's, it's very simple. It's basically just applying the triangular inequality at the right way, but it's a way of, I mean, of talking about classifiers, I mean, breaking, breaking the need of IID data, essentially. You can train on something else, as long as the something else has a low discrepancy to what you later use. So this is very similar to what we want to do, right? We want to train on one task, want to apply it to another task. Um, so here's what we came up with. Um, you're given a certain number of tasks. All of them have unlabeled data. Um, for a subset, we can ask for labels. 
and our goal is to identify a subset of tasks, um, then we'd want to decide which tasks should get their classifier, which of the unlabeled tasks should get their classifier from which um, labeled task. Um, then we ask for the corresponding labels, and we learn all the classifiers. Um, as I'm going to use the parameterization for this, so I'm going to introduce a, an assignment vector C. So that's one number for each task, and it specifies the task. Um, so the, the entry S of this uh, vector indicates what we're going to use in order to solve the task number S. So CS is T, meaning we're going to use the classifier number T in order to solve task number S. Um, since we only have k labeled classifiers available, this vector will have multiples, so it will, at, at most, k different numbers can appear in there, but which ones is up to us. So we have the choice which of these tasks we want to have labeled. <coughs> um, and that's our result. It's a bound that proves um, that learning in this way is actually possible. I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to give you the executive summary. And that says, the error that you really care about across all tasks, labeled as well as unlabeled, will be bounded by a sum of three things. A training error on the labeled tasks. So just for the ones where you do ask for labels. Um, for these, of course, you can compute how well the classifier is doing. The sum of the discrepancies between the task that you want to solve and the task from which your classifier is borrowed. And some of these um, tasks that tell you, is there anything at all that will solve them well? Um, now, these two are computable quantity. This one is unfortunately not. Um, so that derives an algorithm. We can first take all our training sets and estimate discrepancies between them. Then we want to find the assignment, which tasks should be assigned to which other task. And that means we have to minimize the, the task in here that depends on the assignment. So we have to minimize over all possible assignments the sum of these discrepancies. So choosing a few prototypes such that the sum of distances is minimized is exactly the K-Medioids algorithm. So find prototypes that have a small average distance to the other ones. Uh, then for the ones we find, we uh, request the labels. And for the other tasks, um, we just transfer information from the labeled to the unlabeled. <coughs> um, there is one more task, uh, one more term. Um, that always shows up in dom when you use domain adaptation methods, and it's a bit of a nuisance. Um, it's, the, it, it, it's the one that compares not the data distributions, but the labeling functions to each other. Um, this one will be small under the assumption that if two things have a similar distribution in terms of their inputs, it will also have a similar distribution in their outputs. So some kind of smoothness assumption of labelings given inputs. That's an assumption we have to put in. If stuff can look very similar in the data distribution side, but it's completely different on the labeling side, there's nothing we can do because, I mean, we don't have access to the labels, right? So if stuff randomly fluctuates, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. <coughs> so here's the graphical thing. Think of each of these points as a, as a classification task. Um, first step we do, we estimate how similar each of them is to every other one with respect to their discrepancy. So we train, for every two tasks, we train a classifier trying to see how different we can make them. Um, that gives us a pairwise thing. Now we identify this, the, the tasks such that if we use them as centroids, the sum to others will be minimal. That's the K-medioid algorithm. Um, we, we're left with these two. <coughs> so, I mean, we chose up to two, and these are the ones that were chosen. For these, we will request annotation. Here it is. We got a few training examples, positive and negative. That allows us to train a classifier for them. <coughs> and then we can train, we transfer these classifiers to the other tasks that were nearby in the same cluster. Does this really work? Turns out it does. So we did some experiments um, on partially uh, synthetic data, partially real data, uh, object categorization. Um, and I'm not going to go through this in, 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 in detail, but what you can see is that green is lower than red, is lower than black, and they converge to blue. So the, this axis is how many of the tasks were labeled. If you have only two of the tasks, 2% of the tasks are labeled, there's a big difference here. So green is the method we would suggest, where you actively choose tasks to be labeled. Red is the same, but you just randomly label some tasks. 
And black is the case where you collect data for all of the tasks, but less. So the total number of annotations is the same, but um, it's spread over all tasks. So you have very few labels for all tasks instead of many labels for a few of the tasks. And you see the same curve here. So choosing these in a smart way using this algorithm, the centers gives you a lower error across the board than choosing them randomly and also then choosing them um, a little bit of data for all of them. <coughs> okay. Um, let me quickly go through the next part. So um, I don't know what the time is. Do you have the time? Uh, you have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. So I can go medium speed through this part. Um, this was a very, very simple setting. You only le you learned classifiers independently and transferred them to one other task. Right? But then my whole point about multitask learning was that you can share information between different tasks. So maybe you want to not transfer just from one to the other, but maybe you want to merge information from many and transfer from many to one or from many to many instead of just from one to one. Um, so we can introduce the idea of having not just one-to-one -one connections, but building new classifiers based on, on larger sets. Um, and the idea is, for every classifier you want to learn on the unlabeled ones, you take a, a weighted combination of training sets, and how they are weighted depends on how similar they are. Um, so instead of this assignment vector, we now introduce a soft assignment matrix. It's a weight matrix that has, for every task, so there's T tasks, and t ta so t tasks from which we can take and t tasks to which we can give. Um, and alpha st indicates how much the task number t relies on samples from task number s. So the columns will sum up to one, meaning overall each task gets the same weight. I mean, they're all equally important. Um, and only k of the rows of the matrix can be non-zero, which means we cannot use samples from tasks for which we don't have labels and we only have labels for k tasks. Um, note that now we can transfer not just from labeled to unlabeled, but we can also share information between labeled tasks, which is usually what you want when you do multitask labeling. <coughs> this is the corresponding bound. I agree that it's horrible. Um, this is the summary. Again, you can bound the error on future tasks now by the training error on selected labeled tasks, same as before, the discrepancies as before, and two norms of the matrix of weights. So this was the term that wasn't there before because um, well, it always summed up to one anyway. So now it turns out that there's, a, there's two norms entering and these are mixed norms like sum of squared entries or square of sum of entries. Um, <coughs> um, so this immediately induces a strategy, right? We first we estimate our discrepancies then we minimize the terms that we can minimize, which is the sum of the discrepancies and the alphas. Both together will tell us who will share from whom. We ask for labels for the tasks that we chose in this alpha matrix based on the algorithm. And then we learn classifiers for each task based on the samples that are assigned to it, which is like a weighted combination of different things. Here's the picture. It's the same situation as before. Now we assign based on discrepancy we l minimize this term alpha norm plus alpha norm plus discrepancy that gives us how much each task shares from each other task. So this task, for example, relies 90% on its own samples and 10% on the samples from this task and vice versa. This task relies 70% on samples from here and 30% on samples from there. This one only relies on that and so on and so on. This, is, this comes out of the minimization over these alpha matrix we collect training, I mean, we ask for training examples for the tasks that actually should be labeled, and then we learn classifiers for all of them. And well, just in this illustration, you see that um, this task more or less becomes a mixture of these two because it had more, I mean, half of the, or this one is like half of that plus half of that, so it learns something in between. Again, you can implement this easily um, and you can run it on real or other data and you will again see that it works better than either random selection or getting your tasks elsewhere. Um, what is interesting to see now is at least on the left, once you label a certain number of tasks, so here 50% of tasks are labeled, that's, I mean, still you save half of the work, then the, the curves actually go below the blue line, and the blue line what would have been if all the tasks had been labeled and you learned them separately. 
So by sharing information in the right way, you actually get better than if you had trained on all of them separately and just on the data that they belongs to them. So multitask learning can be beneficial um, even, well, fewer labeled tasks, but sharing information can be better than information for all of them, but not sharing. So what classifier did you use here you know, um, before image uh, This is a linear classifier on low dimensional features. So we pre-extracted features using a deep network, but then we reduce the dimensionality heavy, heavily in order, because I mean, it's a lot of learning tasks and we have to do a lot of these experiments. So it's like five or six dimensional this PCA. Oh, it's so not a real computer vision experiment. Ah, so the blue line is also that we classifier on top of the deep features. Yes, no, no, all of them use the same features. All of them use the same classifier. They just differ in um, which sample they use to train the classifier. This just this surprises me because as I think, uh, a deep network is also kind of, well, the idea inside of it is that there is also some multitask sharing of data and parameters inside. So it should be formed in a similar way to this. It's, it's, it's a very different thing. So, I mean, these thi these um, the, the feature classifiers and so on, they are trained, actually this is trained on, it's not trained on ImageNet because then you would train on what you're trying to test on. Um, it's trained on a completely different set. But um, these are trained as a multi-class problem, so you have to decide either this or that or that label, which is not really a multi-label thing, which is, no, multi-class thing, which is not really a multi-task thing. But um, even if you would use some multi-task method with a neural network, um, you would need training data for all of the tasks. You have, with the neural network itself, you have no idea what to do with if you don't have training examples, I mean, label training examples. Um, the method here is completely invariant under, I mean, you can train a deep network here instead of a, a linear classifier, it will just take ages, so this takes a few hours. If you have to run a thousand times all these things, it would be years. Yes? Sir, uh, as you've shown, if we choose a too simple hypothesis space, for instance, a, a linear uh, model's family, so you've shown that with those two examples, uh, very clearly, that sometimes we can't distinguish classes, so the uh, discrepancy would be low. And you upper bound the general error with the discrepancies. Yes. So, uh, so if we choose two simple models, uh, then are we underestimating this? Uh, ah, no. Um, in fact, the, the bound hold for every discrepancy, I mean, for every hypothesis class, is not that we sometimes underestimate the true value and sometimes not. Um, the fact is that if we use a simple hypothesis class, and we want to use a simple hypothesis class as easy as possible, um, the discrepancy will be a small number, both the true one and the estimated one. So it will just mean that because the classifier cannot tell these distributions apart, that means they look very similar to the classifier. That also means that if we train on one, evaluate on the other, it will still work. If we use a really rich hypothesis class that can tell everything apart from each other, then there's no guarantees anymore that if you train on one, evaluate on the other, it will look similar. So we actually want to have this discrepancy really, really small, such that, um, and, and for that we really have to use a small hypothesis class. If we use the same thing with a deep network, I mean, if we tried these experiments with a deep network, not only would it take forever, but it would also most likely give us, um, all discrepancies are, giant, are, are huge, and if all the discrepancies are huge, then our bounds are basically useless, it will just tell us that the error of one thing is less than the other error plus one. I mean, since we're talking probability of error, that doesn't buy us anything that the error probability is less than one. So yes, we want to have this term really, really small. Okay, so two minutes about lifelong learning. I, talk, I, I mentioned in the beginning that we do not just want a fixed task set and solve it, but we want to be able to do future tasks that come in one at a time. So how can we do that here? Well, it turns out in this setting, it's really not so hard. Um, imagine you have a certain number of things learned already. Um, now you get a new task. What should you do with it? Exactly the same as before. You check how similar it is to the existing tasks. And then if it's most similar to this one, you will transfer the classifier to that one. Um, or if you wanted to learn with multiple sources, you would just learn new alpha coefficients which are similar to it. Um, what can happen, of course, uh, since we do not assume anything how these tasks are entered, maybe somebody malicious comes and gives you a task that is completely different from what you've seen before, like that one. 
you might need a mechanism telling you if it's too far away, if the discrepancy is too big, then you will have to ask for labels. Um, so you will have to increase the task, the possibility of label tasks over time if you actually want to run this on real data where something completely new can come up, like quantum theory. So, so you will have to need a mechanism to based on discrepancy, either you reuse a task or start a new cluster. So this is the summary. Um, I've been talking about multitask learning with unlabeled tasks, which is not something people have studied before, but I think it's a very um, important direction if we actually think about things like um, personalization, uh, personalized medicine, and so on. So we cannot collect training data from every person in the world. Um, we have to solve many tasks. How can we do that without having everybody annotate everything? Um, active task selection was the first thing that we proposed for this. So you actively identify the most informative tasks, and that way you can transfer information in a more effective way than if you had, for example, chosen them randomly. Um, and this is an algorithm derived from a generalization bound, as I started in the beginning. It's something I like very much that not only can you, it, it gives you the algorithm, but it also gives you certain guarantees under certain conditions. Um, finally, the future goal is really to go more and more into lifelong learning where tasks can come in any time and have to be solved based on what your experience previously was. Um, here it was very easy to do that by just checking the discrepancy, seeing if you want to reuse an old classifier or start a new cluster. Uh, with that, let me thank you for your attention, for staying till the end. Um, and if there's further questions, um, I'm still here for a few minutes, many minutes. No more questions. Did I understand correctly that if you, have, uh, you, if you cannot actively choose uh, the test for which you want to have labels, but you have small number of, but you have labels for some random mm -hmm. data, you can avoid the, uh, the necessity to calculate insane amount of discrepancies? Uh, I mean, this. <laughs> You can always avoid the need to do insane amounts of discrepancies. Um, if you're given which tasks are labeled, you still will need to know which task shares information from which other one. Right? So you would still have to compute. I mean, you have a lot of unlabeled and a few which you know are labeled. You will still have to find out which is the most is the closest labeled task to the one I'm currently interested. In. You would most likely still have to compute the pairwise discrepancy between all unlabeled and all labeled which is much smaller set than between all unlabeled, yes. Um, if that is still too big, I mean, nobody tells you you need the absolute optimal assignment. That is what came out of the algorithm, but if you have a, uh, you can do a greedy search, which might be faster, you might do some kind of, um, I mean, essentially what you're doing is some kind of clustering algorithm, um, and there's very efficient ways you might do some kind of spanning tree stuff and so on, right? So you might not have to actually compute all pairwise terms. This discrepancy fulfills the triangle inequality. So you can actually reuse all these heuristics for pruning your search. Yes? Uh, are your low bounds uh, upper bounds vertical or like uh, <coughs> those based on VC dimensions? <laughs> um, our bounds are also based on VC dimensions in some respect. Um, so one of the terms scales like, or the complexity terms scale like VC dimension. So they're not practical. Um, well, if you have real systems like high dimensional feature spaces, these would overestimate the uncertainty that you have. So they're not practical with the exact constants in front of it. The, the one I showed you was we use low dimensional features where they are fine, but if you go for really high dimensional spaces, um, it wouldn't. So that would be a case where you would rather get inspired and you would say, okay, I have this functional form, it's a sum of discrepancy, sum of alphas, sum of something else, but instead of the actual constant that the VC dimension gives you, you would put in an unknown constant and do model selection in order to find the right regularization constant. Yes? Are many well-known approaches when data are projected on some same subspace mm -hmm. where classification <coughs> is done easily or better than in the general setting. So in a sense, you <coughs> do the same thing. Cluster, so you project on centers of the clusters. So, what is the main contribution? Is it to 
related to the description, the discrepancy, this or? Um, well, the main uh, so the main question is if I have unlabeled data and I want a classifier for it, mm. how do I get it? It's mm. just a bunch of numbers, right? How do I know, if I don't have any signal what is the right answer, what's the wrong answer for this data, how would I be able to create a classifier? I can project it to some other space, but I would still not have labels there. So the main contribution is the insight that using the discrepancy as a measure and the assumption that things that have similar marginal distribution must also have a similar uh, labeling function in the end, that if this assumption is fulfilled, you can assign classifiers from one task to the other based on the discrepancy. So it's the, the transfer is the new thing. Um, how to actually learn, well, it's not really a projection, but I mean, of course, the, the learning of the classifiers, once you do have labels, is nothing new, sure. It's textbook. How about questions? Yeah, yeah, um, thank you very thank much. Thank you.